parental or interpersonal exception rejection theory. So it used to be called parental acceptance rejection theory or PAR theory. And then because it's sort of not really just about your parents, it's about any significant attachment figure, it got changed to interpersonal theory, uh, interpersonal acceptance rejection theory or IPAR theory. So um, sometimes I will accidentally call it PAR theory because I forget that it had kind of a name change. Also, the name change hasn't really caught on. But it's important because not everyone is um, thinking of this model primarily through a biological parent. All right. So, IPAR or PAR theory. So, the theory states that um, when you perceive yourself to have been rejected by your dominant attachment figure at any point in life, you perceive that lack of presence as them rejecting you. That can happen without you having even ever met them. But, of course, you can also have a parent who withdraws later in life. Um, or even in adulthood sometimes uh, you can be dealing with the rejection by an attachment figure. So at any point in life, so uh, the perceived rejection of an attachment figure tends to be associated with the same cluster of personality dispositions found among children and adults rejected by parents in childhood. So in other words, people who have this perceived sense of rejection, whether you're children or adults, whether it happened in childhood or in adulthood, they tend to come up with the same kinds of characteristics in their, in their adult life. So the basic tenet of the theory is that we are going to develop our sense of self in response to how available our most significant caregiver has been. So how available, how emotionally available has our most significant caregiver been? That's how we develop our sense of self. And what if you have a lot of caregivers? And what if each caregiver was sort of like di available to different degrees? So for me, as you're trying to think about this theory, especially if you had multiple attachment figures in your life, maybe you were raised by like parents who weren't always in the picture or grandparents or a significant aunt or cousin or maybe you were in foster care. Um, it's going to be the attachment figure who was the least available to you, but in a problematic way. So it's going to be the attachment figure that you most strongly wanted to be available and was not. So for some of us, for example, we may have had a caregiver who wasn't available to us, emotionally available. Maybe they were never in the picture and we just didn't care, right? So for some of us, for example, it wouldn't have mattered to me if my grandparents were not in the picture. It's the one, it's the person whom you most want to identify with and have them be available to you who withdraws their care, either intentionally or unintentionally, that is going to be the attachment figure that you're going to want to think about. And again, this was always a perception thing. So your uh, attachment figure could have uh, died in, in war service. They could have been um, locked up against, you know, unfairly by an unjust legal system. Um, they could have had to travel abroad a lot for work so that they could pay for you to go to a fancy school. I mean, there's a bunch of reasons why your caregiver that you're thinking of in this model wouldn't have been available to you the way you would have liked. It's your perception that that is rejection. That's the issue. What happens with your attachment figure is that when the attachment figure is not available and then your little child brain or even your adult brain chooses to interpret that lack of availability as they rejected me, they left me, or you perceive their availability as they've accepted me, right? They are here for me. You develop a sense of personality characteristics and those personality characteristics are dependence and independence, and then acceptance and rejection. So I'm just going to kind of go through these, and I put a little chart in your study guide to kind of help you. So IPAR theory looks at two different dimensions of your relationship to your attachment figure. There's the warmth dimension and the dependence dimension. The warmth dimension has to do with the quality of the affectional bond between you and your attachment figure uh, and the physical, verbal, and symbolic behaviors your attachment figures use to express those feelings. On one end of the continuum is acceptance. That's warmth, strong senses of affection, care, comfort, concern, nurturance, support, or these things we call love, right? That we do or do not experience from our attachment figures or caregivers. The other end of the continuum is marked by rejection, and that's obviously the opposite. That's the absence of significant or with significant withdrawal of these feelings and behaviors. Sometimes the presence of a variety of physically and psychologically hurtful behaviors and effects. But dependence like warmth is also construed kind of as a continuum with independence on one side and dependence on the other side. And we know, of course, from relational dialectic theories that these are more like tensions, dependence, independence, dependence, independence. Those are more like tensions, like, like acceptance, rejection. We're never in a relationship, I don't think, where everyone just accepts us. 
All right, so highly dependent people are um, those who have a frequent and intense desire for positive response. So like they frequently need affirmation, pay attention to me, um, let me know I'm, I matter, right? Because they're not getting those kinds of things voluntarily. And they're likely to make many, many bids for response, meaning they're likely to do a lot of things that are gonna get somebody to pay attention to them. These are people for whom differentiation from their attachment figure was an unpleasant or stressful experience. And likely there's like very few boundaries between the attachment figure and the highly dependent person because the attachment figure probably wasn't good at helping to create separation between themselves and the child. Highly dependent people can look like people pleasers, right? Oh, please, please let me do whatever you want so you'll love me. Or they can look like... Um, constantly acting out, constantly uh, doing misbehaving because either way they get the response. So whether I'm doing everything you want me to do, like cleaning the house 24 seven, and that maybe makes you, if not show me affection, at least you recognize my value, right? You're like, oh, like at least you don't get mad, for example, if the house is clean. Versus I could uh, come home and just like throw shit everywhere and throw a tantrum because you're still going to pay attention to me. And yes, you might be paying attention to me because it's negative, but it's still attention. So as a child, and sometimes I think even as an adult, when the person who is significant to you that you care about, that you want to approve of you, withdraws care, you perceive that they withdraw care, you perceive that they're rejecting you, you perceive that you don't know where you start and they begin, right? Because they haven't helped you develop a sense of you being able to do things on your own while them still supporting you but not being the same person, whether you act out positively or negatively, either one of them gets that person to pay attention to you. And unfortunately for a lot of us, when we behaved, our attachment figure would just ignore us because why would they pay attention to us? They could just go and do their own thing. But when we misbehaved, that's when the attachment figure would pay attention to us. And so we learned that misbehavior gets us the response that we want. It seems counterintuitive because we're getting a negative response, like we're being yelled at, we're being disciplined. But if it's between a negative response where we're being yelled at and disciplined or no response, we'll choose the negative response because at least it's some kind of a response. So highly dependent people are making, have frequent and intense desire for positive response. And by positive, they just mean like, um, like a noticeable response. Yes, I would like it to be positive, but I'll take negative if that's what I can get. And they're likely to make many bids for response. And they're, they're people also for whom differentiation from their attachment figure was an unpleasant or stressful experience. So they don't feel comfortable being left alone to be autonomous because to them that feels like rejection. Then on the other hand are highly independent people. And highly independent people are those who have their need for positive response met sufficiently so that they are free from frequent or intense yearning or behavioral bids for, for attention from significant others, right? So these are people that don't need to get a rise out of other people to feel appreciated. Um, and that's because they probably had a family of origin that was good at setting up boundaries, explaining why the boundaries were there, reinforcing the boundaries, um, and also making it safe for you to be independent and not feel like you needed the approval of other people in order to be successful. Also, highly independent people see themselves as separate from their attachment figure. They see themselves as differentiated, but not like in a rejected way. They just feel comfortably like I am me and they are them. And yes, we communicate and we get along and they're there for me and they, they can comfort me and they can support me. But I ultimately am not the same as my, as my family of origin. So highly independent people are differentiated and they have a strong sense that they'll be fine on their own and that they are they have the capacity to make their own decisions. Um, now, we need to distinguish true independence, which is feeling secure in your separation from others, from defensive independence, which, is, uh, which looks like healthy independence in that individuals make relatively few behavioral bids for response. But unlike healthy independence, defensive independence continue to kind of crave that warmth and support, that positive response, although they sometimes don't recognize it. Um, uh, indeed, because often there's like an overlay of anger and distrust and other negative emotions generated by chronic rejection. These people don't often positively deny this need. So it's kind of like this to hell with you. I don't need you. I don't need anybody. That's just another way of expressing dependence, right? So there's people pleasing dependence. And then there is, um, people rejecting dependence. 
they're both symptoms that when you were younger or into your adolescence primarily, or maybe even in a significant adult relationship, somebody or several somebodies who were your attachment figures, people that you depended on, that they have not done their job. And so you, that creates dependence in you because since you didn't get what you needed and you didn't learn to wrap your mind around it, you just keep wanting it, right? You have